All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for continuing to join us throughout the day here at the Litham Partners Spring 2024 Investor Conference. Uh, once again, my name is Robert Bloom, Managing Partner of Litham Partners. And during this presentation, we welcome Jaguar Health, ticker symbol of JAGX on the NASDAQ. And once again, joining us from the company is Lisa Conti, the company's Chief Executive Officer. Lisa, welcome. Thank you, Robert. I love this conference. And um, should I launch into the presentation? Well, let, let me just make one quick reminder and then I'll turn the floor over to you. I just want to uh, remind everyone that uh, if you've not uh, yet uh, scheduled your one-on-one -on -one meeting with Lisa and would like to do so, uh, you can send me an email. That's bloom, B-L-U-M, at lithumpartners.com. Or you can visit the uh, landing page for the conference, lithumpartners.com forward slash spring 2024. From there, you can click on the investor and attendee registration, make your one-on-one -on -one selection. So with that, Lisa, the floor is now yours. Okay, thank you, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm very uh, anxious and anticipatory of the information that we have to put out today. You know, in the pharmaceutical business, you're in clinical trials, typically pivotal late stage clinical trials for a long period of time. And the updates that you give are enrollment and business development activities, but it's a very exciting time because what we have said, and let me get to it, let's get through the forward looking statements here. But what we have said is that the top line results from our phase three clinical trial to expand the indication of our currently approved product, Mitesi, trade name, Crofelomer, the generic name, from the HIV indication to prophylaxis cancer indication is imminent. So we've upgraded it to the most, the, the soonest expectation that you can have. And I think certainly before I, I speak at any more Lytham conferences, we will have that information out there. And um, the other thing that we have done very recently that is an important difference in the presentation today is we are fully committed to cancer supportive care. And you know the lead R&D effort and clinical development effort that we've had for several years has been crofelomer in the on-target trial. That's the prophylaxis for cancer therapy-related diarrhea in all solid tumors. Um, we've added a commercial asset now, and that commercial asset is a product called GelClare. It's already approved. It's approved as a device, and it's for protective, soothing, and comfort for mucositis, which is a problem in many, many different cancer therapy protocols. But in particular, where would you initially launch head and neck cancer, bone marrow transplant, 100% of those patients end up getting mucositis. So a great place for us to start our commercial footprint in cancer supportive care, and then broaden as we bring on my Tessie with success in a pivotal trial. And that's not the end. We are fully committed to cancer supportive care. It is a huge growing field now with the different targeted therapies and immunotherapies where patients are living even in a metastatic situation for 5, 10, 15 years. And the key there is living, not just existing. So managing what is currently tabulated as about 21 different side effects that these patients are dealing with. Um, the other thing is re relatively recently, we reported our earnings for the first quarter and the first quarter of 2024 was a nice increase of approximately 20% over the first quarter of 2023 and uh, about 4% versus the fourth quarter of 2023. And that, as a reminder, is our current indication of mitesi with HIV. So not representing the commercial growth that we're looking for as we evolve our footprint to predominantly be in cancer supportive care. HIV cancer, HIV supportive care is not going away. That's more of a stagnant market because of the way the therapies have improved in that area and we're moving into the very high growth area with a high priority, high importance, high patient comfort, high focus on allowing patients to stay on their life-saving therapy in cancer supportive care. So as a reminder, just to back up, we do all our drug discovery from plants used traditionally in tropical area. Our, our products that we develop are plant-based. 
they are organic, they're sustainably harvested, they're fair trade, and my Tessie crophalomer is an FDA approved drug. And it is the only oral drug approved by the FDA under botanical guidance. And under botanical guidance, there is no practical pathway to bring a generic to market. So even though we have 150 or so patents issued and no, new IP filed all the time, we essentially have an exclusive position in the market globally to infinity and beyond. So my testy is currently approved for HIV-related diarrhea. And as I've talked about many times, it's what's really wonderful is it is a pipeline within a product because of the novel paradigm-shifting mechanism of action of normalizing gut function and the ability to be utilized safely without resistance, without tolerance, um, without the risk of constipation, for example, that you have with opioids like Imodium or Loperamide, an opportunity to be used in many chronic situations as well as acute, but we've really focused on where the mechanism of action provides a dramatic advantage and nothing else out there in the market. And just today, we announced investigator-initiated initiate, results, positive results for functional diarrhea. So if you look down there, chronic idiopathic diarrhea, functional diarrhea is idiopathic, no one knows the cause, but chronic symptoms, specifically with loose watery stools, there can be pain as well. Sometimes that will then dip over into a diagnosis of diarrhea, predominant irritable bowel syndrome. We do have two published studies on diarrhea, predominant irritable bowel syndrome. So you can think in the future, additional indications that we'll pursue for registration would potentially include irritable bowel syndrome, functional diarrhea, inflammatory bowel disease. But right now we're focused on the near-term indication of cancer therapy-related diarrhea and on a prophylactic basis. <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to mention, we do have an ongoing effort right now for a rare disease business model of crophelomer. So it is crophelomer, but it's not mitesi. It's a different formulation, different business model as we focus on orphan indications of short bowel syndrome <clears throat> and a pediatric intestinal failure problem, ultra rare. And in particular, the one that we're focused on in microvelous inclusion disease. Five different clinical efforts being pursued right now on three different continents, the Mideast, Europe, and the United States. And we expect to have proof of concept data late this year into the beginning of next year. Remember, there's five different clinical efforts. There's two different disease states that we're focused on. With proof of concept data, successful proof of concept data, we have the opportunity for early patient access revenue generation while the product is going through full development in Europe. Early patient access is reimbursed. A program that exists in Europe does not exist in the United States. So two very important clinical development stage results coming out this year, resulting in, with success, meaningful revenue opportunity in 2025 and beyond for three different indications, cancer, microvelous inclusion disease, short bowel syndrome. Um, the last thing that I will mention are of upcoming news and milestones is we have a focus Jaguar. We commercialize my testy for HIV in the United States ourselves. We've learned a lot about the education and the promotion for novel mechanism of action like crophelomer. And we will continue that effort as we move into cancer. We will have footprints on the ground as we launch gel clear later this year. But we are, would ideally like to have a co-promote in the United States with a partner that has much more capability to put more footprints on the ground and get greater reach. Um, outside the United States, however, we are looking to partner, to collaborate, to license. And for example, I think it's about two months ago, we did a license to Genelac for crophelomer in Turkey and Baltic regions and Russia. And you can expect to see 
more licensing and business development deals, particularly with the success in the clinical trials, what we'd be looking for is non-dilutive dollars to access to license our product, given that we have taken the risk-based funding to get it this far and of course beyond with the upcoming results. To give you some idea of um, how tra transformative this can be for patients, as well as all the stakeholders in the company, including our shareholders. If we look at cancer therapy-related diarrhea, for example, this study is prophylactic. If we look at an analogy for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, which is typically prophylaxis for the first three days of cytotoxic chemotherapy, that is about a $4 billion market around the world. Easily, 50% of that market is generic when you think about how it is valued. And these agents typically are used just for that limited purpose. So let's say a six-month program of chemotherapy, six cycles, nine cycles for the first three days. With the targeted therapies that are out there now, we are talking about diarrhea chronically every single day for months, year, years for patients who are taking on, staying on targeted therapy in a metastatic situation. Um, there's about 80% of these patients are dealing with diarrhea. There's about 18 million cancer survivors living in the United States right now. So absolutely transformative in terms of providing comfort, dignity, the ability of cancer survivors to live the life that that they previously live and, and not just exist. About 40% of the time, cancer patients in treatment will go off their cancer therapy, off their life-saving therapy, specifically because of the side effect of diarrhea. And now we're talking about the opportunity to affect the, the impact of the treatment, the survival of, of the patient. And then there are other third-party studies that show that it costs about three times as much to take care of a cancer patient on therapy with diarrhea because of the hydrations, um, electrolyte imbalance, ending up in the hospital. And in fact, there have been patients who have died in some of these targeted clinical trials because of the dehydration and the um, organ shutdown associated with severe diarrhea. So, and that now is something that focuses and gets the attention of the reimbursement organizations as well. When we look at um, our rare diseases, our orphan indications, we do have orphan indication designation in the United States and Europe for short bowel syndrome and MVID. These are markets that third parties put at about $5 billion. So as I said, a different business model, relatively small number of patients, 40,000 or so for SBS and just a couple of hundred really for MVID, ultra rare, but high mortality high morbidity, high expense um, due to the parental nutrition and the complications. Patients can cost as much as $500,000 to $1 million a year. So that's a different business model, a different formulation that is medically appropriate for these patients. Um, and uh, another shot on goal where we expect, as I mentioned, clinical data towards the end of this year, into the beginning of next year in support of reimburse revenue generation and product access. One of the things that have we have done as a supportive care company is really embrace patient advocates and the patient community in every step of what we're doing. We brought patient voice in in a survey before we designed, for example, the clinical trial, prophylaxis trial for cancer therapy-related diarrhea. What would be clinically meaningful? What would be meaningful in your life as the level of diarrhea that you're dealing with on targeted therapy and the reduction that you're looking for? The trial itself was a first of its kind trial where the primary endpoint is based, based on patient reported outcomes, very sophisticated apps that are utilized every single day by the patients for the full three months of the primary endpoint and well over 50% of the patients continued for another three months thereafter and had to continue to fill out their apps. Um, and then our scientific advisory board has as members, patient advocates who are uh, representing the importance of, of that patient voice, which sometimes 
is not as full or historically has not been as fully embraced by the healthcare community. Again, it's a different time. It is the absolute right time for supportive care in cancer because there are so many wonderful breakthroughs that are keeping patients alive for a long period of time. But 21 unmet needs with side effects that these patients are dealing with. Um, our campaign is called Make Cancer Less Sh Shitty and Censored. Um, uh, censored because, you know, a double entendre there. Sometimes, you know, you're not supposed to be saying a bad word in the conferences, but also because sometimes these side effects are not being recognized as they should be. For example, grade one and grade two toxicities in most scientific papers, clinical papers, are considered tolerable toxicities. Tolerable to whom? Grade one or grade two, let's take diarrhea, for example. Grade two, seven loose watery stools a day with uh, urgency and incontinence every single day of your life. Tolerable to whom? And think about 21 different side effects that could land in that category. I'm going to shift now and talk a little bit about um, Gel Clair, this product that we in license for mucositis. Again, a paradigm shifting approach. What is out there now for mucositis are those wounds that occur in the mouth. As I said, 100% of head and neck radiation patients. And they're on radiation, I believe it's every day for six weeks. And, you know, 100%, let's say at 10 days, are going to have mucositis. And imagine knowing that you have to continue that radiation for a positive outcome in your treatment, and you have this horrendous pain in your mouth. What mucositis feels like, and I can speak to it because I actually had mucositis. I had grade four. It feels like broken glass in your mouth all day long, every single moment with a habanero pepper on top of it. So it's ripping pain and, and hotness as well. So what happens now is there's something called magic mouthwash, which is basically lidocaine. And it try to, tries to numb or dull the pain. And it lasts for like five minutes or so. So you're constantly dosing with that. Whereas gel clear is a novel mechanism of action. It's coating. It can be used in a protective way. It's soothing. And it doesn't cause that numbing situation. What you want to do is get the patient number one, some some relief from this chronic pain, and then an opportunity to eat, drink, stay hydrated. Once you get to grade three and grade four, you know, you're going to end up on parental nutrition. You're going to end up in the hospital and at risk of all sorts of other types of infections, not to mention potentially going off of your life-saving, whether it's chemotherapy or, or radiation. Um, talk just a bit about the rare diseases. The, the, the clinical situation there is intestinal failure. So intestinal failure occurs when you don't have enough real estate. You don't have enough surface area. The patient doesn't have enough surface area to absorb their nutrients of life, their proteins, their carbs, their vitamins, et cetera. And um, so they end up on parental nutrition, in some cases, 20 hours a day, seven days a week obviously a catastrophic situation for the patient. There is a product that's out there now called uh, Gatex, which is essentially a growth hormone. It is not standard of care by any means whatsoever, but what it attempts to do is grow the gut a bit so that there's a little bit more surface area so that the patient can reduce their parenteral nutrition by about 15 or 20%. And now you have an accepted regulatory endpoint. And that's what we're looking to do with crofelomer. In our case, an anti-secretory agent decreased the secretions into the gut such that we can get to about 15 to 20% reduction in the time necessary for parental nutrition. Let's say that's a day. Let's say that allows the patient to get out of the hospital, get out of their house, go to school, have a, have a day with friends. A huge, huge impact on quality of life as well as the medical impact. Parental nutrition is one of the most toxic things that you can, can do to a patient. Also look for better stool formation and quality of life measures as well. And um, what we're looking to do with crofelomer is to become the standard of care. So one of the issues with growth hormones, and there are others that are in the pipeline of development as well, 
but they're growth hormones. So they all have a limitation in that they can't be used with patients at abnormal hyperproliferative risk, like cancer. Can't use it in a cancer patient. Even uh, a, 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 a rheumatoid arthritis patient. Patients who have had surgery, and it takes them about 15 to 18 months for their bowel to adapt. That's about a third of the short bowel syndrome patient. Profilomer does not have that risk has a great chronic safety profile, can be used before surgery, after surgery, with a growth hormone, without a growth hormone. So what we're really looking to do is transform the patient experience, again, with a novel paradigm shifting mechanism of action of crofelomer. And that's the same thing with MVID. MVID is intestinal failure, patients on parenteral nutrition, but they have a fully intact gut. It's just not functioning. So there's not even a growth hormone approach for these patients. There's no approach, therapeutic approach for these patients other than parenteral nutrition. Um, I've talked before about our doggy product for chemotherapy-induced diarrhea in dogs. This is crofelomer. So the indication that we're moving to in humans, there is an indication for chemotherapy-induced diarrhea already in dogs, a prescription product called Canalevia. And we also announced recently that we filed an IN uh, investigational new animal application. I'm forgetting what the acronym is, but an investigational new animal application to potentially expand the indication to all non-infectious diarrhea. As a conditionally approved product right now, it's only available for chemotherapy-induced diarrhea in dogs. Dogs, by the way, are a remarkably predictive model of the human situation, which we've had both in clinical development and as well as commercially. I mentioned our earnings and how they were growing just in HIV, but by the end of this year, you can expect to see revenue, net revenue generation from our footprint movement into cancer supportive care with Gel Claire this year. Um, Magdalena is a joint venture that we have devoted some of our pipeline, our early stage psychoactive um, plants that we've collected over about 30 years in the ADHD area and um, attention deficit hyperactivity in adults. And we just recently took one of our product plants that has uh, experience in the field with symptoms of schizophrenia and a very exciting botanical product with a, a lot of preclinical data that has been moved into Magdalena as well. The goal of Magdalena is to take plant-based products through to initial clinical development under botanical guidance, our expertise as we have with Crofelmer, and then partner with one of the many very well-funded companies that are focused on psychoactives and psychedelics. There's about seven out there now that they're all focused on, psilocybin, MDMA, ketamine. What's the next generation of ways to treat and potentially cure mental health disorders like ADHD and now like schizophrenia housed in Magdalena. And that is a um, both an equity play. We own about 40% of Magdalena and very specifically with the schizophrenia entry, there would be license, there would be royalties and milestone payments that come back to Jaguar. Um, a lot of meaty milestones coming up, as I mentioned this year, clinical milestones that lead to very real revenue generation and very real business development opportunities. And you could probably expect some other in-licensing opportunities as well as we tick off the rest of those 21 um, side effects of, of cancer care. And with that, I will leave that slide up, which is the highlights of what I spoke about and turn it back to you, Robert. Fantastic. Thank you for uh, for the presentation here. Uh, we've got about five minutes or so. Let's touch on on sort of each, a couple of different topics here. Um, starting with sort of the the, the in, in licensing here. What what was sort of the uh, the thought process here about expanding your footprint uh, beyond just simply HIV related sort of supportive care to to include sort of just general cancer related supportive care. Yeah, and as I mentioned, you know, HIV, because of the developments of the antiretrovirals and the elimination of so many of the side effects relative to how bad they were 30 years ago when triple combination therapy first came out, it's an important market, but it's a relatively small market. It'll never be more than about, you know, $25, 30000000 million in the United States. 
Um, and we learn so much about having this paradigm shifting mechanism of action. And there is still growth in HIV because of enteropathy, which is an issue with aging people living with HIV AIDS who have had the virus in their gut for more than 10 years. That's about over 50% of the population right now. Contrast that with cancer. Cancer is just uh, as, a, as a supportive care market. A lot of companies struggled in supportive care if you look back five, 10, 15, 20 years. But now with these targeted therapies that are allowing patients to live for, for so long, we have really found this as our mission to allow these patients to stay on these therapies and have their life back. You hear, I hear, I, I have communicated with probably 50 different patient advocacy organizations and you hear more stories than you would like to, more stories than you would think of patients who go off their life-saving therapy because it's just not worth it because of the side effects that they're dealing with every single day. And that is now our mission. And that was the commercial impetus to bring in Gelclair, the clinical development in, in, uh, interest be, behind Mitesi, Crofelimer for cancer therapy-related diarrhea, and you can expect more. Uh, that's what I was going to ask. Is that is that sort of a, a plan going forward? Is to 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 look at other in licensing? It sounds like uh, within the supportive care space. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Like look at neuropathy, look at fatigue, hair loss, uh, cramping. There's a lot of unaddressed issues <laughs> in supportive care for patients. Um, it, talking about sort of expanding um, indications for crofelmer here. You right? You you talked about the um, uh, submission of the, the clinical trial application for MVID, uh, as well as uh, short bowel syndrome in, in Europe here. Um, anything that you can sort of add on here as it relates to uh, some of the benefits of, of really sort of an orphan drug model, right? Because these are each orphan drug uh, indications. Yeah, you know, there are companies that have their whole business model is, is rare diseases, and that's not us. But there is a, a business segment. I mean, it's not segregated, but a business segment around the orphaned indications. And we have housed a lot of the direction, the clinical direction of that in our Italian subsidiary, Napo Therapeutics, which operates in full collaboration with Jaguar. But thinking ahead to patient access, where that can happen early on is in Europe, not in the United States. So we wanted to make sure that the, the core of that knowledge base and the lead on all the clinical development was coming from Europe. And I just came back from Italy a couple of weeks ago and met with some of the clinical investigators. And you know these individuals really are, are doing God's work. Some of these patients, for example, the NVID patients, the moment that they're born, they have essentially cholera levels of diarrhea because their intestine is not functioning. Some of them never leave the hospital. They never leave the hospital their entire life. And, and as I said, those patients have no, no therapeutic options because a growth hormone approach wouldn't work with them, which is not standard of care anyway. I mean, if we can provide one day, one day a week for them to get out of the hospital, how huge would that be? As well as the opportunity to survive beyond you know, beyond their, their teen years. So the, the, the patient drive and quality of life is important. The shareholder financial return, the business models for, for rare diseases. And we do have a published paper where the product was prescribed by one of our physicians to a short bowel syndrome patient, which was really life-changing for that particular patient. And that's what, you know, that's a major motivating factor for the team here. Uh, maybe just the final question here, and and you, I think you chatted about this a little bit, right? But you've got the 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 INAD, right, investigation new animal drug. Uh, Thank you. You did that better than me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's obviously it, it sounds like uh, general diarrhea in dogs is is a common problem. Sort of connect that to to what it would mean as it relates to sort of the the, the formulation for dogs or animals versus the formulation. Uh, and, and, and human situations and how you can derive information from one towards towards the other. Yeah, so the, just to clarify, the, the product that's approved now, can alleviate CA1, it's a conditional approval. It's like orphaned indications for human. It's sort of a combination of orphan and early patient access for um, unmet needs in, in animals, in this case, in dogs. So can alleviate 
can now only be prescribed by veterinarians for chemotherapy-induced diarrhea. You can imagine how many inquiries we get about general diarrhea. It's one of the top reasons why dogs are, are brought into the vet. And it's interesting as we compare to, to humans. So mechanistically, almost identical. If you look at the gut of a dog, on the channels where crophelomer works, it's identical to what you're seeing in humans. It's highly conserved across all mammals. But when you think about the quality of life issues, it's almost more recognized and embraced by doggy parents because you can't talk to the dog and say like, just suck it up, it's gonna be terrible for a little bit and then you'll be okay. And then there's the quality of life of the family home, the rug, the bed, you know, the ability to hug and, and, and cuddle the dog. So we've learned a lot about how to, as I said, to educate and promote not only the healthcare professionals, but to the, the ultimate caregiver as well. And the other thing that we've seen interesting in dogs is particularly in the cancer area, those manufacturers of the cancer agents that cause the diarrhea are pointing to canalevia. They're pointing to crophelomer because they recognize that it allows the patient to stay on their product longer, which is good for the patient and good for the manufacturer. So, so good for all of us. And all that will carry over to the human side as well. Fantastic. Well, we'll uh, we've uh, run out of time, unfortunately, but Lisa, greatly appreciate the presentation uh, today. Uh, again, I do want to remind everyone, if you'd like to schedule a one-on-one uh, -on -one meeting throughout the conference here, send me an email. Uh, again, that's bloom, B-L-U-M, lithumpartners.com. Uh, visit the website, lithumpartners.com forward slash spring uh, 2024. From there, click on the investor uh, registration tab. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, look to get you uh, taken care of. Again, Lisa, enjoy the rest of the conference and uh, appreciate your time today. Thanks very much. I always love this conference. Thanks.